John Holmes, thanks very much for your willingness to talk about your participation in what at that time was the second biggest terrorist attack on American soil. Obviously, the biggest one was September 11th, 2001, and that involves uh, thousands of deaths. Um, this, uh, this, this attack that you were involved in, it, you know, the, the casualty um, toll was, I, I think, 14 dead and, and 22 wounded. So compared to 9-11, obviously, it's much smaller, but obviously for that community and for those families, it's a, it's a huge number, and it was the second biggest terrorist attack on American soil at that time. Uh, and the date was December 2nd, um, 2015. And so first, what was your job uh, at that time? And then what was your agenda for the day? Uh, I was a probation officer assigned to the warrant apprehension team. So basically, we go after people that are wanted, they have warrants, they're in violation of their probation terms. And so we had been working for about a week to set some high uh, priority targets. I had a list that we were gonna go out that night and I went out in the morning and I was looking at those places and seeing what kind of vehicles, animals, any obstructions that were gonna be there and I took notes and then I headed back into the office. And then, so um, what, what time did you, did you then get into the office then? Um, the exact time I don't remember. Right, yeah. um, it was maybe 10 minutes before the attack happened. Okay, and so the attack's about 11 o'clock, I think, about, about 11 in the morning. Um, and you were with, you working for the, the city of San Bernardino or for the county? The county. Okay, so you come back to your office and then, you know, in between, you know, getting back to the office and hearing that something big had happened, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah, they, they had a supervisor that ran into our office and said, hey, are you guys listening to the San Bernardino PD channel? And we said, no, what's up? We switched our channel over, it took a couple seconds, and we hear that there's an active shooter. We knew that it was at the IRC. Uh, I looked at my boss, who immediately grabbed his gear. I was already geared up. And we both headed downstairs as quick as we could. He jumped in his car, I jumped in my truck, and we headed towards the IRC. What usually takes you, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes to get there, it took us about three minutes. So the IRC is the Inland Regional, the Inland Regional Center. Correct. So had, had you, you'd pretty much just walked in and then as soon as you got in your office, your boss comes in and says, you know, something's going down? Yes, yeah, so we didn't know. All we knew was there was a shooter and we didn't know the location at first because uh, your assumption is always that it's a school when it happens. Yeah. And so it just took us a second to figure out the location. And then as soon as we found out the location, we started heading there. So you said usually it takes 15 minutes to get there, but this time it took three. Obviously, you've got your sirens, you know, blazing. We don't have sirens. Oh, so you didn't have, you didn't have sirens on your... Well, so then how did, you, how did you get through the traffic then? Uh, what we did is uh, we headed towards it, and luckily we had two sheriff's units that were in front of us. So they were the ones who were blazing sirens, and they were going against traffic on the... They were going southbound on the north side of the street. So it was a sheriff, sheriff, my boss, and then me. And so my biggest worry at the time was somebody's not going to pay attention and see the first two cop cars and then hit my truck. Wow. Had you ever just, I mean, putting aside what happens at the Inland Regional Center that you're going to see in a minute, just even what you're describing right now, uh, had you ever been involved in anything like that? Um, not to an active shooter. I've responded to officers that, that needed help, um, but I didn't know what the situation was, but nothing that was this extreme. So you, you had been involved in, you know, with uh, sheriffs or police with their sirens blaring. Oh, and, and you, yes. You've been, you've done that a lot. Yeah. So you know you've got an active shooter, you know you've got the, and you know now that it's at the Inland Regional Center. Did you know at that time, you know, now the Inland Regional Center is kind of a complex, right? So there's yeah, there's there's three huge buildings that are there, yeah. but we knew based on what it was that it was going to be in the the back part of the building, the east end, is yeah. where there is where everything happened, and the police that showed up before us 
were on the west end of the building. And so they kind of just showed up at the, the front of it and we showed up at the back of it. Did you know, um, at that time, did you know what the, what, you know, the part of the, of the center where the shooting took place, did you know what that was, you know, what kind of stuff went on there? Did you know what kind of work was going on there at all? Yeah, we, we had been, we had done training in the room that they, that, that they had the party in where they got shot. Um, we'd been there before to do training. Wow. And so that's what it, it kind of hit home. You know, it's, it's different if you go to a place that you've never been, but you're like, I've sat in this room before, you know, even though it's been six, you know, six months, a year ago, I've been in that room. So we, it was kind of eerie. And you'd been in that room for training? Yes. For what active, tra active shooter training or what? I, I, I don't even remember what it was. Okay. It, was it wasn't just some, shooter training. Yeah. It was just some kind of regular training. You'd been in there. Mm-hmm. So it took you, you said it usually would take you about 15 minutes to get through San Bernardino traffic because your office is down, basically downtown San Bernardino, right? A few blocks Correct. downtown San Bernardino. Yeah. North of downtown, the regional center is south of downtown, right? Correct. And uh, so normally 15 minute drive takes three and you're by yourself in the truck? Yes. So, I mean... You know, a lot of times I'll ask combat vets, you know, when they're going into a combat situation, you know, I'll ask them, what were you thinking? And they'll say, they'll say nothing, you know, just, you just kind of go into, you know, the training takes over. And it, it, it does. That's one yeah. of the great things is that we would constantly train on things. And so it just became normal for us to do things even though we'd never been involved in an active shooter, when it came time to, to kick in, I didn't have to think about things. Uh, when I pulled to the back, uh, what I did was I grabbed my ballistic helmet and threw it on. I took a deep breath and I said, God, you're in charge of this. And I jumped out of the truck and my boss said, you take the top of the building and I'll take the bottom of the building and our guns were drawn. How many other, you, you said there were, there were some police there, but they were in the, a different spot. Correct. They were at the front of the building. Um, yeah. From what I recollect, there was a lieutenant from San Bernardino PD who was first on scene. And there were three uh, officers that showed up. And then there was a fifth one that I saw on the side, but he ended up going to the front of the building. So there was five officers when we showed up. Five officers total. Right. Yeah. Had, and all of the shooting had stopped by that point? Yeah, there, there was no active shooting at the time. We went in there to say, hey, this is an active shooter and we're going to stop, you know, whatever the threat is. But when we showed up, it was just, it was silent. No, but you didn't know that. When you went into the building, no. did you think the shooter was still in there? We didn't even make it inside the building. Uh, as soon as we were in the parking lot, we had our guns drawn. We looked and we saw that there were a few casualties laying on the ground. And as we scanned the parking lot, we saw maybe 20 people hiding in different spots behind cars and electronic transponders and trees and things like that. And because it was so quiet, we changed from an active shooter to a rescue mission. Just right on the spot. Yeah. And I mean, they still could have been there, but the rule is if there's no threat actually going on, then there would be no place for it. I mean, we could scan three different buildings and we could be there all day, but there was no place for us to go to an active threat. Yeah. So I'm guessing that every, every 15 seconds, probably another police officer is showing up, right? Oh, the response ends up being massive. Yeah, it was, um, I, I, it was so massive by the time I actually made it back to the street that there were, I would say there was probably 500 officers there. Yeah. And that would, that would be lowballing it. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned seeing casualties, so we'll, we'll come back to that, but, um, you know, so how did, how did all this get organized? You know, 
in those in those first few minutes, I'm, I'm imagining someone took charge, and I mean, oh, how did that how did that work out? You know, so that you because you you started playing a role that we'll talk about. You know, I mean, how did it work out where folks just sort of figure, okay, I'm going to do I'm going to go in the building, you do this, I do this. How did that how did that work itself out? At, at first, there was a lot of chaos, and we're using different channels on the radio. Probation was using their own channel. The PD was using their own channel and the sheriff was using their own channel. And eventually what needs to happen is there needs to be an agency that takes over and then everybody goes to that channel. Um, but we didn't know who was in charge at the time. Wow. And so uh, what my boss did, he saw one uh, shooting victim. He had them jump in his car and another officer showed up and they just took off to the hospital on my truck. I lowered the bed and we put in 14 to 15 people inside the truck and there were six of them that had gunshot wounds. And as I switched my radio over to the sheriffs, I heard that they were trying to set up a triage center north of us, but then they changed it to south. And so I had to wait for there was a place for a place for me to go, so I didn't have anywhere to go. I went to a side parking lot, I flipped my truck around and put the engine block between me and the building because we still didn't know what kind of threat was there. Yeah. Um, within a couple minutes, two of the SWAT tanks came in. Once they came in, the triage center was set up and I was able to go out. Uh, the whole street was lined with ambulance. And so I parked the truck, got all the victims out. Each one of them had a different uh, EMT paramedics that they were dealing with. Yeah. Um, at that point, I was ready to go back in. And I got stopped by the assistant chief for San Bernardino PD. And he said, hey, I want you to handle the media. And there were two, uh, there were two deceased bodies that were about 20 feet from me that I was also in charge of, of taking care of. What do you mean you're in, you mean, what do you to mean? Keep people, to keep people away, um, like the media that it wouldn't, you know, that they weren't going to go in there and, and start, you know, taking pictures and, and stuff like that of, you know, uncovering stuff. You know, they were covered with a tarp. And so basically I had two media people and I basically told them, I said, Hey, I know you guys have a job to do, but here's your guidelines. You need to stay within this area. We still don't know if it's safe or not. Um, and as long as you can do that, you're, you know, you're free to do, you know, whatever you guys need to do to get your job done, but help me out so I can help you stay in this area. And, and they were really, uh, everybody just pulled together. There was no individualism on this. And it was from everybody, the police, the sheriff, probation. Uh, there were border patrol that showed up, Homeland Security, the CHP, just everybody. And it was basically, if there was like the assistant chief, who told me what to do. It wasn't like, no, you're not the boss of me or something like that. It just, we knew how to just fall into place to, to get things done. Yeah. I'm guessing as time goes by, you've got more journalists coming too, right? They started to, um, but we eventually what I, what I didn't know at the time is that my supervisor saw one of the victims who relayed to him who the shooter was because they knew him from work. So he took the information, passed it on to the sheriff's intel, and they started doing a workup on him. And so more information was coming in that I didn't know about. And as far as, as what I knew from where I was, I just saw the two deceased people and didn't know how many actual victims there were. Yeah. Um, and they had gotten word that there were some bombs that were going to go off. Yeah. And so the bomb squad came in and once they came in, we kind of kept the media at bay because it just wasn't safe for them. Yeah. I think I remember that. Didn't the media get pushed about a block up or something like that? Yeah. If, if we, we had, a, we had them, a, a, it was a good block South of there um, to where we just like, it's, it's not safe for you guys to be here, you know, so we can't have you here until it gets cleared. And then what we found out later is they were going to come back to set off bombs and it just didn't work out. So there, there were some actual active bombs inside the building. Yeah, I remember that. And then the two husband and wife, you know, they, they took off and 
there was a firefight later that afternoon. Yeah, we, we were, once we once they found out who it was, yeah. there was a uh, there was a police officer and a probation officer that were trailing them, um, and they just basically were doing reconnaissance on them until the SWAT team could show up. Once the SWAT team showed up to their area, they got into a firefight and they took them both out. Yeah, and, and I mean not not far from where the uh, from where the Inland Regional Center was, so. I mean, at, at what point did you know, I mean, you know, you're flying through San Bernardino, uh, you're getting there really fast, you've got an active shooter situation going on, so you know that this is big, I mean, this is bigger than what you've got to deal with, you know, normally, and probably you realize it's bigger than anything you've had to deal with up to this point in your career, but, you know, was there something that happened that really when you're on the scene that drove it home that, I mean, this is, I don't know. I mean, this is, it, a, a, you know, just a huge thing or, or are you, are you just in kind of, I, I was know, kind of, I was kind of numb and just going through the motions. Yeah. Uh, one of the guys that I grew up through the ranks with at one point we were taking a break in between the bomb squad and then the actual takeover of the SWAT shooting. And he came over to me and said, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, I'm fine. How are you? And that night when I looked back at it, I realized that the guy was covered in blood from his head down to his waist. And so in my thought at the time was like, yeah, I'm fine. What's up? And then, it, you know, it's more of a he needed reassurance that everything was okay. And so I ended up calling him and he was like, you know, yeah, I know it was a crazy day and, you know, just stuff happened. But it took a day for it to really kick in. Yeah, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm wondering about because, I mean, it's not a combat situation, but it's like a combat situation. And I've, I've talked with a lot of combat vets, you know. And, and is it kind of that, because you said you got there and you saw two casualties. You didn't, you didn't say whether they were wounded or whether they were... They were deceased. They were, and yeah. at, that, at, that, at that time they weren't covered with a tarp. No. So now, and then now you're, is it the same two that you're now keeping the media away from? I, I had no idea who was actually under the tarp because they just, they brought them over there and they were already covered up. So you've got that and then, and then you're putting wounded in the truck and we'll talk a little bit about that. But it sounds like, I mean, is what you're saying that as all this is going on, you almost kind of go into, um, I mean, just kind of, I don't know what the right way to put it. I mean, you're almost in kind of robot mode, just whatever yeah. needs to get done, get it done. And, you know, kind of the human thing, the emotional thing, that, that'll that come later, but I'm not dealing with that right now. Is that, is that kind of what's yeah. going on? Yeah. Myself, my boss, and then a couple of my uh, coworkers that were on my team, we had it, we had the chance to, to debrief together after everything was over. And all of us were that way. There was, there was no emotion about it. It was go in and do what you were trained for. And there was no thought to even take the time to think about it until that next day. And we went and, and we met with the psychologist and stuff. And our team thinks in a way of not, hey, look, we did a good thing. We think in the way of what could we have done to make it better? Because if this happens again, what are we going to do differently? Yeah. And it, it took a, a, about a week for me to realize the whole magnitude of it because I had to go away for some training out of state. So I wasn't able to debrief with everything. And so when I came back, I was able to talk to people who had roles of they were guarding the deceased waiting for the coroner to announce that they were actually dead so they could notify the families. And those weren't things that you think of normally, you know, the people that escorted people on the bus to a safety place as, you know, people were screaming and crying and things like that. You know, you just think about what your job was and, and you're basically oblivious to what everybody else did. And so I was able to piece a lot of it together by talking to different people and seeing the different roles and it, 
it just made me more uh, sympathetic for, for each of the officers' roles that they had. Yeah. So there are some photos from, uh, of you, and I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm from San Bernardino, and, and I mean, you and I have known each other since we were like three, I think, you know. So I was at the gym, and then when I got back to my office, and I kicked on the news, and I heard that something was going down in San Bernardino, and, um, you know, and then I heard about what it was. And I sent you an email and asked if you were involved. And I think by this, by this time things had settled somewhat. You sent me a, a quick note back that said you were there. Uh, and then I went home and kicked on the news. And, you know, I, I, you know some, of the, some, of the, um, some of the news clips, you know, I saw you, I saw you in them. And I've got, you can't see it, but I've got in front of me some of the photos. I've got some of the, the screenshots here. And the two of the photos that I have that you're in, I'm looking at a white truck, and it um, looks like you've got some, I mean, I'm just seeing right now, just looking at these photos, I'm just seeing one. But you said you, you had a bunch of people in the back of that truck. Yeah, there were uh, 14 to 15 people in the truck. Uh, I had three to four that were in the front with me. The rest of them were in the bed. And... I believe it was six people who sustained gunshot wounds. And so once we pulled up there, we basically said, hey, if you can walk, help the person that can't. And so basically they helped each other get out of the truck and, and get over to an EMT. Yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, was did they go to your truck just because you were one of the first to arrive and, and your truck was, was close or... I, I was the only vehicle that was there when we started loading up people Okay. because my boss, he, he had put one person in his car and, and then whoever the driver was left. And so I was the only vehicle that they could get into. Wow. 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 How long were they in your, were they in your truck altogether? Um, Time. I want to say about 10 minutes total. It, it, it wow. kind of, you know, it escapes you that if you look back at it, you, you know, one minute you think it was 30 seconds and another time you think it was an hour. Yeah. But when you actually go over the records, it was somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes. There's another photo I've got here. It's you and, and another guy. It looks like you've just helped a woman out of the truck and you're walking her somewhere. So you're walking her to the triage? Yeah. Triage if, you, if you go the back of my truck, it was, it'd be like crossing the street was about how far it was. To, to go to the ambulance. Yeah. So each, each person had their own ambulance that they went to, and there was, it was just lined up down the street of ambulance after ambulance. And so they, they'd do their thing, and then they'd take them out of there, and the next one would come and do their thing and get them out of there. Yeah. Um, and then another photo I have, I've got, it's you and... Seven seven women are in this photo. I think I think the photo was taken the next month in January. I think was what happened over time is there was a one of the ladies that was a survivor. She knew somebody from probation and asked if she could meet me and my boss. And so we had an informal meeting with her, and she told us her story. Um, she was in the 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 banquet room. Uh, the person next to her uh, got shot and killed, and she pulled the body on top of her and just laid there until everything stopped. And so she wanted to come and meet with us, and we're like, hey, cool. And, and she said, you know, there's a lot of uh, survivors that would like to thank you guys, but we, just, we don't know how to do it. You know, we don't know who you are or anything like that. Yeah. And so we said, hey, we'll go through the circles of, you know, talking to the administration and so they set up a day where the officers that actually pulled people out and some of the survivors could meet together. And so that was the day that we met. Um, and with that picture, I think three of them uh, had gunshot wounds out of the six. Um, and it was really weird at first. When everybody got there, it was like a junior high dance where the IRC people stood on one side, probation stood on the other. It was never... 
not a, not a single officer do I know that was like, oh, look what we did. You know, it was, it was a very humbling experience of how it happened. And so we didn't want any kind of ego in the way. But once we started talking to people, it was just the floodgates open and we were just having conversation, joking and, and things like that. And most of the conversation was not to deal with the shootings. It was just like, oh, what, you know, what are you doing? You know, what's, what's your family up to and things like that. And we came to find out that the more normal our conversations were, the better we felt about things. I just think that with probation, there was something that happened that really made it humanized with how they were treated. I mean, I, I can't look back and say there was one particular thing, but just in the ensuing um, meetings that we had with them, there was some kind of connection that it wasn't just we did our job that day. There was just an, a, a huge amount of compassion that they felt. Well, in the in the video I've looked at, you know, um, some of it you're in, and then some of it is, you know, in the same area. You can kind of tell it's in the same area, but you know, you're not on on camera. There, there are a lot of those vests that have, you know, probation big on the back, right? Right. And so, it, I mean, it seems like, it, is that right that it was the probation guys who, when it comes to dealing with the, the wounded, was it, I mean, mostly or a lot of probation guys who are actually doing yeah. work with those um, groups, right? Whereas you got the SWAT guys and the others, they're doing their work, but they're not having that personal contact with the victims. Yeah. Um, my main partner, one of the things that happened with him is he went back in to, to clear the building for any threats. And he ended up getting a lady who was shot up pretty bad. And he had her in the back of his SUV and he was holding her. And she bled out and died. Mm. Um, and there's another guy that I know uh, that's also, we both know, Rob. Myers, um, the same thing happened to him in his car where they were sitting there holding somebody and trying to do, you know, first aid, whatever they could. And the person bled out and died on them. And it's something that, you know, first of all, we're not really trained for that particular thing, but even if you are, I don't see that that's something that you can really be prepared for. It was later in the afternoon uh, when the shootout took place and the two terrorists were killed. Yeah, um, we we were getting we're ready. ready that went down. We were getting ready to go back to the office, and they needed to take pictures of our cars because of the um, the blood and stuff like that. Yeah. And so we were told to go back to the office. We got in the truck, me and my supervisor, and we heard over the radio that there was a pursuit for the shooters. So we joined in with the pursuit. Um, we went over to one of the main intersections of uh, uh, Tippecanoe over by the, the Costco. And we basically blocked off the traffic because we knew the SWAT tank was going to come in. And so we were about two blocks away from it, but we blocked off the main traffic. The SWAT tanks came in. Uh, we listened to some of, of what happened. And then once everything was safe, um, we, we knew our job was done and we headed back to the office. When you joined that, um, you know, that, that operation that leads to the shootout, was that again, just about, you know, doing your job or was there a little bit of a, um, a revenge thing in there too? It, it, it was, I don't know revenge, but it was like, I need to see this through. I can't stop at this point. So I, I, I don't remember having any feelings one way or the other about the person, but it was just like my job's not finished yet. Until, you know, they're stopped, there's still stuff for me to do. Did your wife know that all this was going? I mean, she knew it was going down, obviously. Everybody, I yeah. think everybody in the country knew it was going down, but did she and, know that you were involved? At, at some point, it, she was watching the news and at some point I was able to shoot her off a quick text and I basically said, I'm here, I'm safe. And when I get the chance, I'll give you a call. 
So we're actually talking. Uh, I think I think the five year anniversary is um, is two days from now. Yeah, so, yeah. So we're we're talking on November thirty. Um, suppose December second came and no one, you know, no one said anything about it. Does the would it make a difference for you or? It it would. It's something that I don't want. Is I don't want to sensationalize it yeah. you know I never want to hear the guy's name that's that's something I, I hate about the media you know it's like just the shooter that's all you need um, yeah but I feel that what happened with Orlando about a month or two afterwards it eclipsed everything and everybody forgot about San Bernardino and they forgot about the victims mm. not only the deceased but their families the people that that had to witness it and so it's something that this should be remembered and honored. Yeah. When you say it should be honored, um, I mean, what do you what do you mean by that? I I don't know. Like the, I, I honestly don't have an answer for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're talking about it, you know, not being forgotten. And, you know, it's true because Orlando did happen very soon after, right? Yeah. And then there's some other stuff. And, I mean, I don't remember, you know. It, it seemed that once, once Orlando happened, that's all you heard. I mean, every week there was a shooting somewhere after that happened. And so you just kind of, you would get callous to it. You, you know, the news would come on, another shooting. You're like, yeah. I'm turning the news off. I don't want to listen to this anymore. Well, yeah, and so I think, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that by, you know, it should be honored what you're saying is it should be something other than just the big media story of the moment of early December 2017, 2015. It's fresh on your mind, everybody cares, but then you just forget about it and you don't realize that there was a mom with three kids who don't have a, who doesn't have a mom anymore, you know, and unless you're that immediate family, it just, they cease to exist. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Well, this is why, I mean, this is why I hope that, um, you know, that we can get others who were involved in one way or another, either on the civilian side or the law enforcement side or some other side. I hope we can get more of them to talk because, I mean, I know that, I know that, you know, there were the, the documentaries and all that 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 came out um but all that stuff is packaged you know which is fine i mean that's what you've got to do but um you know i just i think it's i think it's important to hear from the people who were there from all different perspectives and to just put the story down and to be remembered that it was you know it's a story about people you know yeah are you are you are you glad that that um, that that event happened in January and then the next one where you were able to connect with some of the folks that you you were able to help on December second, twenty fifteen? Oh, that was amazing. It was it was like a cloud got lifted once you that day that it happened. You know, we said it a lot of times. They got off the truck, they went into an ambulance, and they got out of there. And you don't know what happened. Yeah. But I saw that group of ladies and they were able to say, oh, yeah, this other guy, you know, here's what's going on with him. Here's what's going on with them. Uh, so at the time, I knew that everybody in my truck survived. And it, it, and it gave you a good feeling, you know. It, and so meeting those people and knowing that things are going to be okay it just that's what it is you know 